Okay, so I'm going to start the recording. It's um, it's nine o'clock, okay. and um, yeah, Jamin, so good to see you. Good uh, to see you too. It's been just over a year, I guess, uh, since I saw you last, and for uh, Tribeca 2019. So um, I, I started, this was sort of a coronavirus idea. It was sort of like, oh, well, you know, let's have some chats about um, the career of a filmmaker, you know, the life of a filmmaker and what that looks like. Uh, I talk to so many filmmakers who, you know, that's their dream. They're either, they're either there already or it's their dream to be um, working as filmmakers full time. And um, so I just had this idea to start these conversations and, um, you know, sort of casual and about business and career. So of course I wanted to talk to you and, uh, and you know, see how everything is going with you as well. Um, so actually, uh, I, I know that you went to film school, but I wanted to ask you this question about, you know, when was it that you first realized that you wanted to be working in film? Yeah, for, for me, it was, uh, and good morning, everybody. Um, it was, it was, and thanks for having me. Um, uh, for me, it was, I was actually um, studying, um, English literature in Boston and I hated it because it was too cold since I'm from Miami. So I transferred and the one caveat was that um, I didn't lose any credits because my mom couldn't afford to pay any more schooling. And um, I was home in Miami for a little bit. My friend was at University of Miami Film School and we went out to make, you know, he was making his first short and he had no idea what to do and I didn't know what to do and I ended up making this film for him. So, um, so I ended up when I transferred, I transferred to UC Santa Barbara and became an English and film major. So um, I always say like, you know, uh, I was on a plane to the Spirit Awards one year. And I was it was when JetBlue didn't have the Mint class before like JetBlue introduced the class or, or a, a section. It was all, you know, one, you know, everybody had the same seats on JetBlue back then. And on the um, same aisle of me going to the Spirit Awards was um, John Sloss, the, the attorney, producer in New York. And I, of course, was reading contracts the entire time, and he was reading scripts. And so I said to myself, well, why did I go to film school? I should have gone to law school, and then, you know, I could be reading scripts, and he could be reading contracts. Because <laughs> um, that's sort of how it works, right? You know, you know your intent, of, of course, is to, to be creative, and to, you know, create stuff and, you know, identify, you know, identifying the word maker can be many things, but yeah. the idea of telling a story. Um, and of course I was, you know, reading cast agreements and John Sloss was, you know, probably reading Boyhood at that time because it hadn't been made yet. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's, um, I don't think I ever knew that you had, uh, that we were both English majors. Well, yeah, English lit and film, yeah. And film, yeah. yeah. I don't think yeah. anyone would have let me just pay for film school, so. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I went to UC Santa Barbara, which was mostly a, a, a history and analysis school, mm. not a physical production school. We right. did um, shoot short films on uh, 16 millimeters sync cameras. And um, we did make several shorts. Um, the, the, my senior year, I made a short with another filmmaker uh, friend named Morgan J. Freeman, not to be confused with the black actor, but um, who ended up um, applying to NYU and going to NYU. And that's how I ended up in New York because I knew he had the longest coattails that I could hold on to. And um, went to Miami for several years of cutting my teeth in production, you know, learning the ropes. And then when he had his first feature going, moved to New York and did his first feature with him. Yes, so I remember the days in, in Miami when you were, as you said, called it, cutting your teeth in production. Yeah, um, yeah. Is that sort of the path that most people go to uh, when they finish film school? 
You know, I, you know, I don't, I don't know how um, different it is now, but um, I think that's how a lot of people's path ends up. You, you, and I know, uh, you know, uh, there's a set, dec a former set decorator in New York who's now um, in a writer's room. Um, I know a key grip in New York who is now uh, directed his third feature and has another one set up. Um, another key grip friend of mine um, uh, has written a, a TV show. So I, I think it's everybody's story is different. You know, everybody has a different um, opportunity. Um, I don't think my friend Morgan was ever going to work as a grip. Oh, right. um, he was never going to work as a set decorator, but um, but for some of us, that's part of the path, you know. And uh -huh. and I think mine was more when we made that film in 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 our senior year. I understood very clearly that um, we were we were co-producing, co-directing, co-writing. I understood very clearly that I was a better at putting the things together, and he was better at telling the story. So I, I knew my senior year in, in film school that I was going to be a collaborator. And so when I sort of picked a path, I think there was a moment where I had to make a choice. And I think I made the wrong choice, but I had to make a choice of um, sort of um, two different job choices, but they were also sort of career choices. And one was, um, uh, I actually got asked to be the prop assistant on John Sales's Lone Star. No way. And I was like, this is amazing. I'm a huge John Sales film. You know, Buff, like, they're from another planet was like a game changer. Um, and then I got another offer, which was sort of a big deal for me at that time. Prop assist thing was 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 because I'd already been doing it in commercials, but was offered a second AD position on a TV show in Orlando, and that was more of a management position where where I was sort of seeing myself heading, um, and I had to make this choice, like this very difficult choice: do I do I second AD this garbage TV show in the back lot of Universal? Um, filming overnights at the Western World stage set in the New York City, you know, street, or do I go and be a prop assist on Lone Star? Mm -hmm. So obviously my heart went one way, my head went the other way, and um, I, I went and did the um, I went and did the TV show, unfortunately, um, only because you know John Sales and Lone Star I just feel is so important, and so those those choices are so hard to sort of interpret for anybody else you just make those choices on your own in and in and in on your own and in that particular moment yeah 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 and part of it you know i think was the right choice because my my experience as an as an assistant director became my experience towards production managing line producing and producing and um and you know that, that that doesn't work for everybody and again you know uh, you know i know Key Grip, who is now, you know, directing his fourth film. Um, actually, you guys should watch this filmmaker. He's really brilliant. His name is Ron Morales. Um, he's a, a genre filmmaker, but he's made some really cool films. One um, that is in development right now with Melissa Leo playing a bridge toll operator. And a, um, again, this is a little bit genre filmmaking, but he's ma making a film that Melissa Leo is a bridge toll operator a boat comes into this um, uh, New Jersey uh, river that leads to the big port. It's this only bridge that hasn't turned into, um, that hasn't given up its, its operator. All, and it's true, it's, it's, there's one bridge you, that still has to raise the bridge and go back down to let boats through that are of a certain size. And so she's the bridge toll operator and she realizes that it's a potential terrorist threat and so she's like the hero, the anti-hero hero in this terrorist, you know, plot. Um, yeah, Ron Morales, who's, you know, his credits, if you look him up on IMDb, his credits are all key grip credits. And then there's two director credits. Fantastic. So, yeah. Fantastic. 
So it's interesting, you said that in your senior year, you realized you were more of, you used the word collaborator and you didn't use the word producer. So when did you realize that you were a producer? I mean, that, that's the same term, isn't it? Okay. You know? I mean, well, I think I that's the same term. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the, the place that you, um, you know, it's, I think it's the middle child syndrome, you know, like you, you um, know who you are at some point. And at that point, I understood partly myself, but also partly my friend Morgan, who is just a genius and a very, you know, um, cerebral creator, you know, he can, he can spitball like there's no tomorrow. Um, we actually just hung up. So he and I are still collaborating together. We're actually Fantastic. producing a TV show together right now. I mean, we literally, I had to hang up early because we had to start early, but well, that's because he started late because he was, he's still, you know, sort of, you know, still Morgan. <laughs> the existential malaise is still very, very clear. And, and um, yeah, and I don't want to be a creator. They suffer way too much, you know, like, <laughs> They suffer so much. I mean, he's like, they're drinking coffee and it's 11 a.m. I'm like, you all right? He's like, I didn't sleep. I was like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, the um, the uh, collaborator producer was just natural, you know, and, and I knew it then. I knew it as a, in, in my senior year. Mm -hmm. And I also, again, I knew that Morgan had a creative thing that I didn't have. And so I sort of, you know, grabbed his coattails, but it was it was more of a friendship than grabbing coattails, but it was it, I did know that he had coattails, you know, like I, yeah, I was yeah. conscious. And, and I do think that, that, you know, and I don't know if the group are more producers, directors, writers, whatever. I do know that lining yourself with a filmmaker or two, or vice versa, if you're a director, filmmaker, storyteller, aligning yourself with a producer, I, I feel is, is, um, really important because then you somewhat have a tribe you have people to suffer with you have um people to collaborate and build with and, and all of those things are important you know the suffering and the building are, are both equally important um and doing it with somebody is always helpful so um so yeah he and i you know, and again he's he's had a, a a zigzag career path um which is you know different than say um, I don't know, um, J.C. Shandor and Neil Dotson, you know, I mean, J.C. Shandor's career has been very direct, you know, he, uh -huh. he made that little, uh, not Boiler Room, the other uh, sort of the Wall Street movie. Um, I'm sure if everyone wasn't on mute, we would figure it out. Um, <laughs> but uh, you guys are not allowed to talk. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, you know, Neil Dotson and J.C. Shandor, they made their first little indie, like we did Hurricane Streets, and they just kept on that same trajectory. I think, you know, jumping, um, uh, arbitrage? No, no, it's not arbitrage, but that's close. Um, uh, I like this chat now. I'm seeing the know, chats, you guys, in case that comes up. I can jump in. You yeah, know, if um, anyone else chats, I'll let you know. Um, I'm just noticing it. So if you had already wrote, yeah, margin call. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I guess my, I don't have my view on, so I don't see everybody. Let me see if I can change the view a little yeah, bit. Hold on. Okay, now, oh, whoa. Whoa, <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good morning. I see everybody now. Um, hey. I just wow. want to say, Jamie. Oh, man, this is intense now. I think I'm going to go back to the other view yeah, where I don't see so many way. people. So you're just talking to me. But um, uh. I, I wanted to say that uh, on, the, on the call, I, I don't know everybody exactly, but we have uh, mostly, I think, director producers. Oh, look, there's Ashley in England. Yay! <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, that's not exactly true, but... Um, and I want to go back to, uh, you mentioned about Hurricane Street. So once you all graduated, was that your first film? That was the first, well, yeah, that was, no, that wasn't the first. The first feature. Ooh. It wasn't? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was the first feature. Yes, yeah, it was the first feature, yeah, yeah. And so um, a lot of people on the call are working on their first features. And I always feel as though, you know, by the time you get to where you are in your career, it's like we forget what it was like for that first one. 
Yeah. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you went about putting together uh, that first film, bringing in the money um, and getting it made. Yeah. Um, if, if well, that, that was, what's that? If it was your first feature. It was my first feature and that one is, you know, a moment in time it's very different than now. So, you know, I'll, I'll try and make it relevant, but I mean, that was literally, we met someone at a bar with money. I mean, it was that, yes. you know, cliche <laughs> uh -huh. that, um, and that filmmaker is still making films and is um, like a lot of um, films and financiers today, they're, um, they're, they're part of the solution, but they're also part of the problem because you're literally dealing with a lot of rich kids who have money. And in New York, you can meet that person at a bar. Mm. And this is a Harvard grad whose dad was a billionaire and um, she put in the entire $500,000. Mm. And so that was like the lottery version of, of, of first time filmmaking. Um, what I do am, you think you had or you and Morgan between you had that you were able to um, make that, because even if you met her at a bar and even if she had lots of money or whatever, what was it that you had in place that you feel was able to bring her onto the project? Yeah, yeah. And, and again, this was not a very sophisticated investor or financier. It was her first film. I mean, since then she's, she's financed maybe 30 movies, you wow. know? But I think, you know, part of it is that um, beginner's luck that we made a, a three award, the first time a movie had won three awards at Sundance, she made a lot of money back on her first 500,000. You know, having been at a finance company since then, I know for sure she got super lucky and everybody else who put their mom and dads or their own investment into their into a film, they lost money and they got out. She got tricked into making money and a lot of money the first time out and stayed in for 30 more movies. And I would say that probably even after becoming a more sophisticated financier and producer and, and now a writer director, she has um, probably made money on the films that she financed with equity, with her, her parents' money, probably has made money on 20% of the films, so taking a loss on the other 80. But that's what happens to a lot of people with, with a lot of money. If you make money on the first one, you're in for, a, for pretty more movies. <laughs> because that first one was the exception. So great. You know, there's a lot of other good films that got made because of that at Hurricane Street's investment in that story. But, um, but again, this is, this is going back to the, 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 the exact same problem that we have today, which is we, in the independent film space, we rely on private equity. And most of that private equity is coming from a very privileged, uh, you know, uh, perspective that doesn't tell all the stories that need to get told. So Hurricane Street, which you know is a very East Village, New York coming of age, um, which I think had a, a a good perspective for the world at that time. Mm -hmm. I think we've narrowed even more than then what stories are getting taped, play, uh, told because of the scope of the money that's out there. Mm -hmm. Is a lot of um, private equity that came from wealthy money, you know, wealthy families and, and investors. And, and that doesn't mean that um, uh, with, uh, I'm going to look at chat because someone's going to have the answer to this. Um, Black Bear um, and Schwartzman's company, his dad is like, like the biggest Wall Street. You know, you're recording this? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to watch my what yes, I say. Yes, we, so, we can only tell stories that, you know. I mean, you know, the, 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 it's not like that and Ben is making really great films. He, he, he's, he's made some in, incredible, uh, sorry, Teddy Schwartzman, sorry, Teddy Schwartzman has made some great films, inc including the, the Robert Redford film, um, Lost at Sea, no, um, 
uh, I'm such a bad name dropper. Sea. Come on, guys. Alone at Robert sea. Redford, out in the ocean. Alone at sea. No. No. All is lost. Thank you. All is lost. Thank you, Kip. Hey. All is lost. That was Mark again. Oh, no, no, no. It was Kip. Kip was, Kip was ahead of Mark. Kip was ahead of Mark. <laughs> It was ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, Kip. Oh, yeah. Same director as Mark. Right. Look, I'm, I'm like a oh, JC right. Shandor fan, aren't I? Yeah, so oh. All is Lost was made by um, Teddy Schwartzman, which is a great, great film. Um, and and Teddy Schwartzman, but Teddy Schwartzman's dad is like the owner of Blackstone or, or you know, like, the, like one of the biggest hedge funds in the world, right? Like, like he could actually change global warming if he wanted to, you know? Like, so, 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 and that, and that, and Teddy started 10 years ago and he's been making interesting films and that came from, you know, family wealth. That still is, you know, um, I'm not going to name where I get all my equity because, uh, you know, you guys will all jump ahead of me. But, um, we'll be like calling up. Jamin sent us. But, you know, yeah. there's, 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 you know, money out there, you know, like Jeffrey Soros is now a, a financier filmmaker, right? Like uh, Los Angeles Media Fund is Jeffrey Soros's company. And um, I mean, obviously I think, you know, the Soros family is a little bit different than the Schwartzman family, but still a, a narrow scope as to where you find that equity. And I think finding it at a bar is not a business plan, right? <laughs> so, well, so Hurricane Streets is not exactly <laughs> the, the, the marker for today's, you know, way of getting things made. I, I think it's, I think it's, it's, you know, doing everything you can to make work that stands out and, and incrementally finding your way towards getting that, that, that feature made. Cause, cause Morgan did have, have shorts that, you know, uh, did win other awards and did play other festivals. And I think all of that adds up to, you know, getting money at a bar, if you will. You know? Yeah. Uh, so after you had that like big success with your first film, huh? um, which I'm sure did also have something to do with for you for like, I'm, I want to stay in this. Um, what would you look back at and say, oh, wow, this was a lesson I should have learned before I went down, fell down that hole. What, what would be a big lesson that you, you uh, learned in your career after that? Because that was a positive lesson. What was a more negative lesson? Well, I, I think the early lesson is, is um, for me, and I, this is a producer, and, and I guess it works for directors and screenwriters as well, but it's, it's you know, work with people who want to be storytellers, don't work with people who want to be directors, because I think that has a lot to do with ego and a lot to do with um, described, you know, like, like, I think the storytellers will win in the end, and the people who have something to say will win in the end. Um, as opposed to somebody who's like, I want to be a director. And I think that's just a little bit different. And that's what I learned, which was like, I want to work with, with filmmakers, storytellers. And if they're a director, that's great. But I think that's less important than finding people who have something to say. And, and again, that goes back to finding a, a, the groundwork for, um, you know, making a short, you know, writing something on spec, you know, getting those things out there and and not yeah i mean i guess it's you know it's 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 about that that, that group of collaborators that you find that um that are important to the overall path forward and so aside from uh morgan do you tend to generally work with the same people over and over again or yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, I'm, we, I've been developing a project with um, director, writer, director Susan Seidelman, who you guys might know from Desperately Seeking Susan. We've made three films together so far, uh, where we've developed a script based on someone's true life story called The Girl with the Pink Hair. It's a, about a, um, it's a, two women who survive um, cancer. And it's a it's sort of a commentary, uh, you know, the universal part is the commentary on the healthcare system. Um, but it's two women from Brooklyn, very different worlds. Juliana Margulies playing the, um, the Ashkenazi Jewish woman. 
survives and has to go back to the family tradition that is not what she wants. And she's sort of like, you know, so her family life has changed and that di di dynamic has to shift through the story. At the same time, we see a young African-American girl who's discharged, who's just got out of chemo, is cleared. She goes home to a single mom who's working and she's got her own struggles, which she's still going through some health issues. She didn't get this equal health care. She wasn't diagnosed as early as the other woman. And then they meet up again at a, at a wig store and they develop this friendship. So they had met and then they meet up again and they develop a friendship um, against both families' wishes. So, you know, the, the young woman's mom is suspicious of this friendship and the other woman's family is suspicious of this friendship, but the friendship is more important than the family's wishes them to return to normalcy. And that's, that's, um, uh, that's a, a project uh, called The Girl with the Pink Hair that I'm doing with Susan, which will be our fourth film together. So, but yeah, again, uh, you know, those collaborators are super important. Um, uh, so one of, I think one of the things that I would like to ask you to talk about a little bit is I'm, I'm always talking with my clients about uh, business models or what you call um, that less sophisticated version of financing as opposed mm -hmm. to what you do now, now that you're on film feature number, I don't know what it is. Do you know what it is, by the way? No. It's about 20 or something like that. I do have a very hard time keeping up with you, Jamin, I have to say, because there's always a another film. I'm like, well, when did that one happen, you know? Um, but uh, so I wonder if you would mind going through the process of like, you know, what do you start with? And then what are the steps you go through until that day that you get onto day one of production? Hope you're wearing pants there. <laughs> um, do, do you mean from, from, like, give me the perspective again so I understand. Uh, just the perspective of, um, you know, uh, the, I think what you would call financing, but one of the things that I'm always, I'm always using you as an example of is that when people are making their first feature and they, they're sort of aiming for a number that uh, seems really too high for me, I always go back to the, the business model that you're using, which is that your films are always based on, uh, you're bringing in A-list actors who can guarantee or generate a certain return on investment. And that's really what that's based on. You know, a lot of times I'll talk to filmmakers and they'll be like, well, it's all about this, you know, my script is really good. And I'm like, no, that's, that's not the business. That's not how you're going to get the financing. Well, if the script is really good, that could it help. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 you know, a lot of times, you know, writers, um, uh, early career writers are also first time directors. So that conundrum has to, you know, figure itself out. Um, or a writer who does not have an agent and access that has to work itself out. And then on a producer level, you, um, you have to work with what you have. And 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 sometimes, you know, as a, as a as a as a as a producer who's working on many different things, you then at some point do have to back into a number, and that's even, you know, when you have like this film I was telling you about that got put on pause, um, which, which uh, just hit me with a, a a time for a phone call, you guys. Um, I'll let you know what it is real quick. Hold on one second. Um, it's at 1030 Pacific, so we're OK. Um, so this, this film I was doing with uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor um, directing and starring um, oh. uh, called the, the Short and Tragic Life of Rob Peace, Chiwetel um, uh, under, he did not want to be in the movie he understood that him attaching himself to the movie raised the budget of the movie. Right. Then we cast Stefan James, the guy from If Beale Street Could Talk, 
Oh, yeah. So with the two of them, we also cast one other actor, but it, it, it's not been announced in the trade, so I don't think I, I can announce it here. Um, I'm sure one of you would leak it to Deadline. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're all calling it Deadline. But, um, uh, so, so, so we had a certain number we wanted to make that film for, and then Chuatel took on the role of the dad in the movie which helped bring the budget up, but it didn't bring the budget up to what we wanted, and then we had to cut the budget. Uh -huh. I think that, that happens on, on every film. You know, um, another example, you know, is uh, Bo Burnham, who did um, Eighth Grade. So Bo had, had um, prior to that, had written um, a, a, a larger, a high concept, you know, piece that languished for like two years and, you know, went around the, Hollywood had never got made. And um, he knew quite well that it wasn't getting made because it was gonna take $50 million and he had never made a movie before. We said, oh, I'll go, I'm gonna write something that can get made. And he wrote eighth grade, which obviously um, is, is quite contained in, in, in size and scope. It's, it's, a, it's a coming of age. You know, if, if any of you have seen it, you know that it's, it's um, a young girl and her dad um, at home, at school, the mall and at a party and and on, it. on on that's FaceTime it. or whatever on yeah the, yeah and the, and that movie we made for very very little um uh low two and a half million so um so you know for example like I can do a, a two and a half million a sub two and a half million dollar movie and then go and do you know a 30 million dollar Netflix film like the last thing he wanted and the, the, the money, Otis, will you close that for me? Yeah. The, the money isn't, um, is never enough, right? Like even on the last thing he wanted, we, we wanted more money than 30 million. Um, <laughs> so, so the money is never enough. It's, it's more like you have to understand what the value is. And as a first time filmmaker, a young filmmaker without awards and without, you know, Reese, who had already been nominated for, you know, a screenplay for best adaptation. And with those actors, you know, you're not making a $30 million movie. With the same time with Bo, you know, making a two and a half, which may be more practical for this group, it's still a matter of what sources do you have, you know? And in that case, um, he had some um, resources for money, his own being a little bit, not a lot. He, he, he was not, you know, making Netflix specials by then. He did have some, and this, this is where eighth grade doesn't totally fit the model because he ended up getting Scott Rudin on as a producer and they funded it with Barry Diller. But, but at one point it was going to be a little bit of friends and family money and then go and have a sales agent come on board and use the New York tax credit. It was those three things which were gonna become the overall budget, which was uh, unfortunately only, you know, this this amount of two and a half million because I think once Scott Rudin was involved, it obviously um, stayed at the same budget. Um, it, it, it was, it was it had distribution already in place at that point. Obviously those are, are difficult things to come by. I don't think Scott Rudin reads a lot of scripts before they've already made it through many different channels. Mm, but, right. um, maybe more appropriate is, is a film that I did called Chronically Metropolitan, which is a, a first-time filmmaker named Javier Manrique. And we were trying to make that as a $2 million movie. And we had Ashley Benson and Shiloh Fernandez attached in the leads. And making a non-union movie in New York is very Difficult, or at least for me, it's difficult because it, you know, the unions are very strong here, and I'm sort of a known, you know, producer. So doing something against them is difficult. We ended up doing a non-union movie, which we wanted to make for two million. We ended up making it for about one point two. That was a combination of New York tax credit, some friends and family money. Um, and some uh, uh, international sales, what we call gap money, a loan from a from a lender. 
Um, again, that's a little bit sophisticated. It did mean the same thing that we all go through, which is, you know, you understand how much, whatever you want to call it, friends and family money you can raise, how much money we could get from the New York tax credit. And I know you guys have a hard time in California because the tax credit is almost exclusively limited to the larger films because they look at it as a benefit for the larger state and the larger economy, um, which is really unfortunate because New York is actually mimicking that right now. They're actually eliminating, they've eliminated $500,000 movies in New York, no, sorry, million dollar movies. The, the New York tax credit just changed April 1. And prior to April 1, the tax, you, you would qualify for the New York tax credit if you spent over a million um, and they reduced that um, uh, they, they increase that spend to two million now. Oh. So you have to spend two million in order to qualify for the New York tax right. credit, which is right. therefore eliminating yeah. younger filmmakers, non-union filmmakers, incoming filmmakers, and you know, you know, people who are being a little bit more unique and creative than the um, sort of structured finance system that I'm talking about, which is a little bit. It's not, it's not star driven, but it does have some cast component to it, which is always tricky for young filmmakers. So um, I hope I'm not talking no, too no, no. This is, this is much. All great. No, 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 this is all, this is all great stuff um, and, and really important. And for, to me, you know, the fact that you even, you know, clearly use the term friends and family, you know, no matter who who the filmmaker is here, you know they have some friends and they have some family that they can start with, you know. Yeah. So um, no, I think that's really significant. And one of the things I I specifically wanted to ask you was that I'm seeing these days that you are being listed as an executive producer a lot as opposed to being a producer, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and um, what what that means and how that's working in your career. Yeah. Um, so just, just in, the, in the Scott Rudin example, the eighth grade example, um, you can imagine he doesn't go to set much. <laughs> so, um, so Scott, I don't think in the entire production, I don't think we saw Scott um, except for one time at a meeting at his office, two months prior to shooting, one time during casting, and then in the edit. And um, the other producers, Chris Storer, who's a filmmaker himself, is a very good friend of Bo's, was on set with us every day, but he'd never made a movie before. Um, I think the other person in Scott's office, Eli Bush, who's credited as a producer, came to set one time. At this point, I'm sort of a gun for hire line producer, but with more duties because there are no producers on set. So this is sort of, and you're working the capacity that I was with Scott Rudin. You know, he is the formidable producer there who brought in the financing. He's not in a he's not a day to day trenches person. Right. So instead of taking a line producer credit because I'm having more responsibility and more creative collaboration with the director, it's an executive producer credit. Oh, um, I, I almost was thinking of it as being in the opposite direction, you know, that, huh? but, it, but I knew that that wasn't the case. That's why I wanted to ask you the question. I so was Scott in, was there every day and I was in my office? No, no, <laughs> that uh, with an executive producer credit that you were less hands-on, Oh, okay. Well, that, that is the case. I mean, there's a there's a film that I just did called The Birthday Cake, um, which I think is a good film for everybody to check out. Um, it's it's um, it's not out yet, but I was, uh, you know, again, I served as an executive producer and I was on set one day. So I was Scott Rudin on that project. Uh -huh. um, and that was because I helped put the pieces together from my office. I wasn't there on a day to day basis. I took almost zero fee because it's a friend's first film. Maybe this is a very good relevant conversation here. So this is a friend's first film. 
and he had written a script with a with a musician and director uh, named Jimmy Giannopoulos. Jimmy was a music is a musician, and he and Zoe Kravitz are in a band together. I think it's called Lola Verses or something like that. Um, free budget for anyone who can name the band in five seconds. Free what? A free budget for anybody who can. <laughs> All right, no one missed it. So, um, uh, Hawk, what's up? <laughs> so, um, Jimmy and Zoe were in a band together for years. They put out a couple of albums, and Jimmy met every young actor in the world through Zoe. So, he put together a script um, with this friend of mine, Raul, uh, who wrote it with him. And then they just started casting Jimmy's friends. At one point, they had, um, uh, again, this kid, Shiloh Fernandez, and who was the other uh, early cast? Uh, Ashley Benson. Um, and just relationships, you know, relationships is what this story is really about. Raul had come on to this movie, Chronically Metropolitan, that I had um, written um, and met Shiloh and Ashley stayed friendly with them. Um, Jimmy brought in some actors that he had known from, from Zoe Kravitz. And uh, they ended up, you know, finding some friends and family money and then saying, Jane, that we want to film this. We need to help, we need help putting it together. So I came on as an executive producer and I literally was, you know, producing from my home. Um, they offered me a producer credit and I actually told them I don't want a producer credit because I feel a producer is um, well, I felt like if I was a producer, I would have to give too much commitment. <laughs> so so I, I wanted to take the appropriate credit. I, I feel like credits are so important and they get handed out in ways that I don't totally agree with. And, and in that case, if I had asked for or taken a producer credit, I would have felt my own personal impulsion be much more committed and more involved and therefore on set and I couldn't do that financially I couldn't do that there wasn't enough money for people to make a living on that movie not for myself now Bull, who was a producer and another producer named Sienna Oberman were there every day and mm -hmm. day in and day out for six months they're still there every day except for mm -hmm. remotely doing an edit um, and in the early stages I was there a lot because I had to help the film together, which was structure it for financing, structure the entity for the New York tax credit, mm. bring on an international sales company that could actually give them a value and then go and get a loan against that. Uh, in the end, didn't actually get a loan. They actually got a private equity um, person to come in and, and uh, invest in it as a um, which is, which is better than getting a loan because then you don't owe, owe all of those finance fees. I mean, you know, to me, it's if, you know, it's if you have 200,000, go out and make it. So, th so there's another film on my IMDb page called Wheels. Huh. Uh, again, listed as an executive producer credit. Um, this is a friend from undergrad who I think spent 50 grand of his own money. Um, and then um, made the rest on credit cards. I was an executive producer and I was literally, I mean, I was on set like maybe three times just visited and to see how it was going, but he'd written that script eight years ago. It's just now um, and bought by um, the, the Orchard, which is now known as 1091. Hmm. Um, a lot of these, you know, the, I think the most famous aggregate uh, aggregator is, um, the, not maybe not the most famous, but the one that's been doing it as a business model the longest is Gravitas. Mm -hmm. Gravitas has been around for years, and you know they're buying twenty movies uh, a month and putting them out. So it's hard to stand out. Um, but you know there are outlets for these films. So Wheels is another good example where I was exec producing on a friend's film in order to guide them in certain places. It is different than the storytelling physical production part, which I think a lot of people have enough exposure and knowledge of to do themselves. So developing a story, writing a screenplay, a lot of people have learned that either on their own or with their collaborators. 
going out and shooting something has also been done widely. I mean, the 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 access to equipment and and the possibilities are so much more prevalent. A lot of people can go out and be filmmakers, right? So those two things is what my friend Paul could do, and he knew how to write and to shoot and to tell a story. He didn't know how to actually get a casting director. He didn't know how to form an entity for investment. And so I came in as an executive producer and helped him bring on a casting director, helped him form the investment vehicle for other people to put some money in. Um, he actually had a friend at one of the fundraising platforms. Um, uh, Eden Spark or Kickstarter. Yeah, Spark, Cedar Spark, yeah. Uh, I forget all their names. Yep. Okay. Indiegogo or one of those. Yeah, those weren't the ones that he used. It's a New York based one. Huh. But, you know, he, he did a, a, a crowdfund, put in some of his own money. And then he actually brought in like a couple of like $10,000 investors from friends and family. And so he went out and made that literally for, I think, 50 of his own money, about 20 in a crowdfunding Kickstarter. Thank you. Um, Moez got that one. Um, Moez's so, film just uh, went into distribution this week. Oh yeah, for, who's putting it out? By Indie Rights. Indie Rights, great, congrats. Yeah. Um, so, so fifty thousand of his own money, about twenty thousand in um, in uh, Kickstarter, and then about another twenty to thirty in friends and family money. Some of it he owes back, you know, like some of it is a loan, but it's not a a loan from a like a, a lender like three point capital or ingenious who does this on this, you know, bigger level, but it's a loan nonetheless, you know? Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. And so, so his film at that time qualified for the New York tax credit under the new law as of April one, it does not, which yeah. is sad. Yeah. But his film. So that 10 grand that he's going to pay back, he wouldn't have that to pay back. And we just filed right. the paperwork. So he's actually paying that back. And so, so the other role as an executive producer, and again, this is your, I'm, 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 I was free equity because I, I made no money or I was not paid on wheels. I was paid a small sum on the birthday cake. On wheels, which is this friend from undergrad, I, I've been advising him for eight years on that movie. And all along the way are just like, oh, I don't know how to do this, which is the casting director, I, you know, or now, we couldn't, um, we, we it was, you know, it's the festival circuit and I'm all over the place, but I'm just gonna use wheels as the, yes. the wheels was were shot and, and finished. And then it was, I was advising of what festivals to go to and he was getting rejected all over the place. And I said, well, let me submit it to Woodstock and to Nantucket and to Hamptons, see who wants to play it. And we got two invites out of those. And I said, I would play at Woodstock, even though it's, it's very much a Brooklyn, you know, African-American story, I thought it, it had an audience at Woodstock that would connect to it over the other festivals. It won um, uh, the audience award and best director. Nice. <laughs> so with those two laurels, you can actually start putting a poster together yeah. and you can start getting recognition from other festivals. So, you know, of course, I think he tried for Sundance and all the big ones in Tribeca even. I thought Tribeca was a possibility because it was a New York story with a lot of New York actors. Um, uh, it, 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 was, it was rejected all over the place. Um, San Francisco rejected it. Um, so with those laurels, we got into a few other festivals. He ended up winning, um, you know, like, like six festivals. And then it came time to sell the film. And so I reached out to a couple of sales agents and said, hey, would you look at this film? Here's the, here's the festival wins. And they all said no. For one person, who's actually an interesting person to know, but you know, he wants a retainer. Uh, uh, he wants to be paid almost like an attorney. Right. He requests five grand to be paid up front. Because right. sa typically sales agents work, I'm backing up a little bit. 
So I, 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 also, to the... I also want to stop you because I want to leave a few minutes for questions if you're okay. Sorry, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, we just have 10 minutes. Okay. So, uh, well, let me just finish. So, so please, so no sales agent wanted to sell the film because they didn't see it selling for enough that they would make any money. Right. So I became the sales agent. So I just started oh. reaching out to Gravitas and to Orchard and and you know, but part of this is you know twenty years of, of experience and having relationships, and we ended up having three buyers on it, and um, we uh, ended up selling it to um, ten ninety one, formerly the Orchard. So Orchard was a theatrical company, we gave that up, and they're strictly doing um, uh, streaming. Streaming. All right. Nice. That's a. I love that story. I now go to see the film. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it'll be out this summer on on uh, 1091. Nice. Uh, and I got to look into them too. So we just have Jamin for nine more minutes. Um, but if you have a question, uh, please um, either raise your hand. Or, oh, Karen. Karen McKinnon in Miami has a question. Okay. Uh, oh, here. I, I muted you, Karen. Okay. Uh, hello. Hi. hi. Anyway, thanks for all of this. Um, I wanted to ask a lot of the uh, stories you mentioned talked about casting and being able to secure kind of higher profile casting. So what would you suggest in approaching either is it the casting director if you wanted to go that route of trying to attach uh, someone that was medium or higher profile to help finance the project? How would you suggest approaching that? Um, so I, I think casting directors are super effective because they have people who um, look to them for material. So um, I'm working with Allison Estrin right now. Allison was actually called by an agent saying, hey, this person's looking for material. Do you have anything? And she and I are friends and said, hey, Jamin, can you send me the script? I'm going to send it to them for this actor. Um, so that's super helpful, having those relationships. I think it's it's also helpful to have a little bit of money to pay them to sort of retain them as you were retaining an, an attorney. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and obviously the the idea being is if they like the material, they'll come on board and help you cast. Um, a, some of them um, don't like the retainer casting, like some of them, won't take on, uh, put their neck out for an unfinanced film. Some of them will, some of them won't. Um, you know, it's, I, I think you pick the people who are appropriate creatively um, that you go after first. I think the other way of doing it is directly through the manager, um, assuming those actors that you're after have a manager and an agent. A manager is a lot easier to get through to um, from material rather than <laughs> I am wearing pants. <laughs> um, it's okay. Google, let me finish. I'm almost done, okay? Working parents with coronavirus yeah. 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 Uh, in quarantine, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm drinking my eight year old's palm juice. This is not red wine. <laughs> oh, nice. Who else has a question for Jamin? Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Karen's in Miami. Karen's a Miami filmmaker. Okay. <laughs> Who else has a question? You may have to raise, you can raise your hand electronically or you can raise your hand physically. Well, I guess nobody oh. has any Hi, problem. my name is Elizabeth. Oh, oh okay. Hi. Elizabeth and then Rolf. I, I just have one quick question. Yes. What would be your, um, I guess, I want to be a producer and I'm still kind of new at this and I'm a young yep. filmmaker. So which like route do you think I should do? Do you think I should do line producing? Because I've done a lot of producing with school projects. I've done a lot of location scouting. So I've done a lot of producing in general. So I just don't know where to go, I guess. But why are you, why are you impostering as Juliet Romeo? Because <laughs> I, she That's sent okay. me the link and then are you Elizabeth? I, yeah, she sent me the link and it only opened as her. That's okay. Oh. You can rename I, it next time. Um, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I think that's, that's, you know, for me, that was 
um, I still had to earn a living. I didn't have anybody supporting me. I didn't have anybody in my way to you know become a, a, a filmmaker. So I I was an assistant director and then a production manager, line producer, and all of those things are relevant today. Again, talking earlier, friend who was a set decorator, another friend who's a key grip, um, you know, they all had to make a living as they were striving towards, you know, other goals. And I think that's, if you want to produce, I think, ADing and, and production managing, coordinating, all of those things. I mean, my friend Karen Chin, who um, uh, is a pretty prolific Spirit Award winning uh, producer, um, she uh, was a production coordinator. So, you know, she okay. was in the office and just, you know, learning all she could. And yeah, because that's kind of where I fit. <laughs> what's that? That's just kind of where I fit. Like, I'm really good at, like, uh, just putting people together. And when you said yeah. it was a collaborator, yeah. I was like, oh, my God, that's exactly how I feel yeah. about it. Yeah. But then people were like, you're a lot, you're a producer. I'm like, okay. okay. But, yeah. but you, you still have to make a living. Um, or if you don't, just go out and, you know, produce. Because that's the other thing. While you're coordinating and making some money, you can still go out and produce. You can go out and, yeah. you know, I mean, this group right here looks like, you know, there should be a bunch of people collaborating. Oh, no, Elizabeth, you're going to get, I just put my contact information here in the chat. For okay. You, so please get in touch. So I'm, okay. I'm, I'm getting in there first. Rolf has a question. <laughs> uh, Thanks, Elizabeth. Rolf, you got to unmute. Okay, there you go. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, life in the lockdown and if anything's going to change for you. There's been a lot of discussion about virtual production, digital production, remote work, and so on. If you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think things are going to change. I'm, I'm part of a pretty informal group, but a pretty um, um, in, in, inside group um, created by the bond company, Phil Finances. Um, a lender and insurer and two other producers, Michael Biederman and, and Robert Salerno, um, and the head of production at Endeavor, Kelly Odd. We've all been talking about what it means to go back to work. Um, and two things, I think you asked two questions. One is um, working right now, there's a lot of development going on. There's a lot of pitches going on. Um, uh, my friend Morgan and I were working on our pitch this morning. We're hoping to have that pitch um, to start some some of these meetings for pitches next month, um, which is actually tomorrow. So tomorrow, <laughs> it, this coming month. Um, uh, so pitches are happening a lot right now. Um, I think we all, you know, know. I mean, it's it's sort of common knowledge that the big beneficiaries of the quarantine are the are the platforms, the streamers, right. and. Um, they're still in what I call the content wars, and this has actually encouraged the content wars. It hasn't diminished it. Um, it's, it's diminishing theater uh, uh, cinema experiences uh, because of the social distancing and the idea that you know we can't all go into a movie theater. But um, I, I won't lament about that because I think that's something we could all just cry about for the next hour or two. But but um, I would um, let's all hope that secret cinema comes to our cities. Um, you guys should look up secret cin secret cinema at some point. Uh, but but um, it's almost like an underground club for for cinema. Um, AMC kicking out Universal is is not going to happen. Uh, but yeah, the the quarantine is not affecting the traditional route of you know what I call Kleenex, right? Netflix, Amazon, um, they're going to keep going. I think, you know, right now I'm, I'm in conversations with two independent financiers. Again, when I say independent, it, it means people who have, are still using equity, but they're pretty sophisticated groups, you know, rep by CAA and Endeavor. They're not just somebody I met at a bar. Um, they're still in the business. What they're going to have to grapple with is expense of going back to work, which I think on a on a, on a lot of films is going to be between 50000 to a million dollars. Um, I think people are going to actually ask that um, working hours are reduced. Um, we're all going to be, you know, given PPE. 
Um, the, the last question I think, or the last answer to what I think is most of your questions is virtual production. Um, I think what's gonna happen is there will be more stage production because live action is still live action. Animation at Netflix has not stopped. So animation has continued. Uh, there's a, a company that all of you should know because they really, really love new filmmakers. They don't care whether it's commercial or not, is Cinereach. I'm sure most of you already know Cinereach. Uh, Paul Mazay and Carolyn Kaplan over there are fantastic. Um, they're in the middle Paul of Mazzei? Paul Mazay and Paul Caroline Mazzei. Kaplan. Back in the day? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. They're at Cinereach. Cinereach, their main, they don't have a finance model. They have a model of that we want to find new people that, that are telling stories. Uh, no, Caroline Kaplan. Um, okay. They're they're um, they're in the middle of a um, animation project. They wow. Shut down, and they're just now I think coming back. With had to end up you know spending more money though they needed more they had to go back and raise more capital that um, was necessary to because instead of having thirty people on one set had to rent other stages and separate people more but things had to spread out more as opposed to being like okay let's save money art department sure. half service you know yeah. equipment is all in one stage no they had to separate everybody yeah. and and that obviously costs money even for a little company like Cinereach. Uh, Jamie, so there, there's, there's a documentary question which any documentary producers with a science focus in the room documentary producers okay oh yeah I got my chat open now. <laughs> Jamin I want to be respectful of your time so either we can go okay. or we can take one more question what do you want um, I think one more question is good I have to prepare for this 130 that just came up Rebecca go put pants on for that one <laughs> Rebecca go ahead hi oh perfect um, so I've been producing this film. Uh, unfortunately, we're in post-production right now and starting marketing. We don't have name actors attached to it. However, the acting is really good. I have a possibility to get name musicians and name composers attached to it. Do you think I should try to lead some of the marketing with those if they're on the A-list level? Or... Yeah, I mean, I think all of the, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but the festival platform is probably a place for you to go, one of the routes for you to go. And I think the festival programmers, you know, if they see, you know, Dinklin Hinkloff on a credit, they're going to go, oh, wow, Dinklin, you know, made this. That's, you know, if they see Teddy Shapiro, they're going to go, oh, Teddy Shapiro, you know. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I think that composer could make a big difference um, to get somebody's interest because they look at the building block and they don't know anybody, but oh, composer sticks out 100%. Uh, and, and that composer, almost like casting director conversation, casting director coming on board gives you a third party endorsement. And so when the agents mm. <laughs> see Allison Estrin, you go, oh, wait, Allison likes this. It's got to be good. She's never, you know, she's not doing crap besides billions, but whatever. Um, someone's going to make a living. <laughs> um, yeah, if they see Allison Estrin or, you know, I can't pronounce that guy's name, Dinklin Hickoff, they see, um, you know, their name, and yeah, 100%, they're, they're going to, um, uh, you know, take, take a closer look and if they know nobody on the billing block. So okay. all of those ideas are good ideas, whether it's composer, casting director, production designer, and, and wherever you are, I know those people exist because everyone knows that you don't have to live in New York or Los Angeles to be a filmmaker. So, um, so yeah, go for it. Okay, cool, thank you. Jamin, thank you so much for My spending pleasure. some Thank time you. with us and um, uh, telling all those stories. Um, it's really, I really, really appreciate it. It's great to hear. And the uh, other composer, Tamar Kali, did uh, the last thing he wanted with Reese is amazing as well. So. 
but somebody somebody said in the chat earlier he could listen to you all day and that's how i feel exactly i'm so excited that i i got to bring you on here we ended up with well, for the other 20 people <laughs> bye yeah, yeah it sucks <laughs> never mind <laughs> well we ended up with 40 people on the call so um you know thank you and um yeah and for me i i work with filmmakers i help people find some money to make mostly my clients are making their first feature and ah. so here's my um calendar so that you can talk to me and i just want to thank all of you for being here uh, whether you've made your first film i see moez here mark already has um or not um karen's going to rolf's going to be doing that um julia you send me a list of the names so i can track people yeah sure i will because okay. Because I actually got it set up that that's actually going to work, that I'm going to have everybody's email address. So, um, but thanks again. Please say hi to everybody in the family from All right. Me. All right. And All right. we'll Bye. talk soon. Bye. Right. Bye. Cheers. Bye. And thank you, Joanne, for putting this together. Thanks, Rebecca. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Joanne. It was really yeah. fantastic. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Awesome. Least. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Oh, great. I guess maybe he has to go. We don't have sure, to go. We don't have to just talk about him. Good to see you. <laughs> Love you. Thank you very much. Nadia, Nadia where are you uh, calling in from? Uh, Delhi City, San Francisco, right next to it. Okay. Okay. We had Karen yes. in in Miami. Who else is in Miami? Edward is in Miami. I'm in the UK. Ashley's in the UK. I'm so, no, who said the UK? Edward. That wasn't Ashley. Ashley, did you, that wasn't you. No, me. Oh. I'm in the UK. Who's who's speaking from the UK? I can't. Chris. Yeah, this is Chris. Okay. Oh, Chris, you're in the UK. Yeah. That's fantastic. Whereabouts are you? West Kirby by Liverpool. Oh, listen to that accent. That is fantastic. Yeah. Nice. That is fantastic. And Ashley, where are you about? In Leeds? Are you, are you in Leeds? I'm in, I'm, I'm in Leeds. You're in Leeds. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much for the mailing list. Thank you for coming. That's awesome. Where else do we have outside of the Bay Area? Juliet is in Miami. Yeah. <laughs> Another Miami. In. And Karen, who else? Hi, Karen. Mark? Mark Gordon is in New Mexico. Santa Fe. Santa Fe. Where else do we have? Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. Diane. Yes, yes. Rebecca, where are you? You're, you're here, right? In the Bay Area? I'm in, I'm in the city, uh, East Cut more specifically, but yeah, San Francisco. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who else from, from beyond, beyond? What did you say? What? What, Karen? Oh, I was just looking at, did someone said New Jersey? Was New Jersey. Oh, Juliet, what are you doing in New Jersey? Oh, can't hear you. Can't hear you. Not Can Juliet, you? Liz. Sorry, I'm still kind oh, of. Uh, oh, that's right. That, that keeps. Yes, it's yeah. Liz masquerading as Juliet. <laughs> yeah. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. I couldn't fix it. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. However you got here is fine. Alberta's, Alberta's in calling in from Trinidad yeah. and Tobago. Yes. I ha have to go. Yes. Good afternoon, oh, thank, everyone. Thank you, you guys. It was absolutely amazing. Thank oh, you, Joanne. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was, it was so incredibly valuable. Great. Joanne. Great. All right, well, we'll go for sure. And, and I, I really do work with filmmakers making, mostly with filmmakers making their first feature. Um, and so please uh, set up a time to talk to me. I would love to meet you and um, find out what you're doing um, with your films. And by the way, uh, anybody who signed up for this, I made an error because I was looking forward to doing a, a Thursday weekly uh, talk with us. And I'm starting with like the people that I'm closest to and who I know that I normally, without quarantine, they, they'd be on set somewhere and whatever. So, but my very next person can't do next Thursday. So I can't do a recurring series and I'm gonna have to reset everything. 
So if you've signed up for next Thursday's talk, which is actually going to be on Tuesday <laughs> with Ben <laughs> Vanderveen, um, I'm probably going to have to cancel all of that and start all over again. So just so you know, I'm having a little a little technology challenge because my 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 idea, brilliant idea of meeting once a week, um, is not going <laughs> on the same time every week is not going to work. <laughs> no Chris, did, how did you hear about this? Chris, Chris in Kirby. I heard about it. Um... I think it was on Twitter, maybe. Twitter. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Because I'm always looking out for things. Right. I'm what so do you do, Chris? Chris, what do you do? I'm a writer. Oh, cool. Nice. I'm an expat. I'm a Brit in the Bay Area. So. I now have to jump off. Now I'm late for something. So I'm going to have to go, but so good to well, see you. Well, thanks for everything, so everyone. glad you enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. All. Nice meeting everyone. <laughs> Bye. So glad. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you all. Bye. 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 Bye.